I mean, when I was in Farmington, one of the guys came up to me and he said, you know, this band saved my life. Mm -hmm. uh, his, his wife had died and it was a very difficult time. And he was a widower and he said, if it weren't for this band, I would still just be sitting alone in my home. Welcome to episode 10 of the Bandwagon Podcast for the week of April 29th, 2024. On this edition of the program, news and notes from the band world, including a pair of stories about bands saluting their longtime directors, a salute to a band parent, another behind the scenes at your local podcast thought, and I have a conversation with a creative person whose job it is to help creative persons with the non-creative part of the creativity business. Phew! I'm your host, Rob Hammerton. Hello, dear listener. The first several minutes of this week's episode contains three examples of recognition of people who have left legacies in the band world. I didn't necessarily plan it that way, but it's a nice trio of different yet related stories before I even get to this week's trio section. So, Adjust your head joint, and away we go. Let's play the first strain. In this episode's first strain, news and notes from the band world. Dateline Harrisonburg, Virginia. This Thursday evening, May 2nd, the James Madison University School of Music will celebrate the career of Dr. Stephen Bolstad as he conducts his final concert as director of bands, a post he has held since 2007. Concert performers will include the JMU Wind Symphony as well as the Valley Wind Ensemble, a semi-professional wind ensemble from the Shenandoah Valley that Dr. Bolstad also conducts. In addition to overseeing the university's band program and conducting the JMU Wind Symphony and Symphonic Band, Dr. Bolstad has taught wind literature and conducting courses and led the master's and doctoral programs in wind conducting at JMU. Under his direction, the JMU Wind Symphony performed several times at Virginia Music Educators Association conferences as well as at the College Band Directors National Association National Conference in 2015. From 1994 to 2007, Dr. Bolstad was director of bands at the University of Montana. Prior to that, he held similar positions at the University of Montevallo and Livingston University, both in Alabama, and was director of bands at St. Mary's Area High School in St. Mary's, Pennsylvania. He's a past president of the Montana Bandmasters Association and is currently the state president of the Virginia chapter of the College Band Directors National Association. Dateline, Pella, Iowa. Credit to the reporting of KCCI-TV in Des Moines as well as KNIA-KRLS Radio in Knoxville, Iowa. Guy Blair died last month at the age of 78 after a recent cancer diagnosis. Blair was the pillar of Pella High School's band program and the legendary director of the Pella High School Marching Dutch for 32 years, from 1973 until his retirement in 2005. In an interview with KNIA KRLS Radio, current Pella High School band director Damien Place said, quote, It's hard to put into words the impact Guy had, in a broad sense, music education nationally even, and more specifically our state. I think he served literally on every board in a leadership role at some point in his career and even his retirement. And then the 32 years that he served as director of bands at Pella High School, leading the program to the places that he led and really paving a way for excellence for countless students that have come through Pella High School, and in addition to people like me who got to student teach and learn from him. Blair contributed to a string of what is now 49 consecutive Division I ratings from the Iowa High School Music Association. He also led the Marching Dutch to its first two trips to the Rose Parade in California. Now his former band students are planning to honor him at the Tulip Time Festival, a community event in Pella. As they walk in the Tulip Time Parade this Saturday, May 4th, nearly 200 Pella Band alumni will hold signs representing every year of Blair's career. And that's news and notes from the band world for this week. If you have a news item you think should be included in this segment, send me a link via email to heybandwagon at yahoo.com. Now we'll take a quick water break and meet you on the other side. More bandwagon in a moment. Okay, let's pick it up with the second strain.
in this week's second strain, second week in a row that I have something of a eulogy for you. I don't plan to make a habit of this, but if it needs to happen, it needs to happen. There are some differences between last week's tip of the cap to the late Paul Alberta and this week's remembrance. First, this week's is a return to a piece of writing I did about 10 years ago. No, exactly 10 years ago. About an event that happened 10 years before that. Also, this week's remembrance is of a gentleman who claimed not to be musical at all. His standing joke was that as a child in the Midlands of England, he was kicked out of the convent school band because he couldn't hack the second woodblock part. Long story short, this is not only probably a silly made-up tale, it's also demonstrably untrue, the not being a musical person part. On top of which, my conversations with people in the know suggest to me that English schools are not exactly a hotbed of wind band activity. Curiously enough, it's the company-established brass bands that have filled that role, as anyone who has seen the movie Brassed Off will confirm. But even if this English gentleman didn't play an instrument and wasn't a performing member of a band, at least after the age of 10, he was an important person in the band world. On a smaller scale, much smaller than your John Philip Sousa's and Frederick Fennell's and Catherine Scott's and other people from those lofty band heights, perhaps. But still, he made his version of an impact. If you were reading my online blog in 2014, I would say, read on. But instead, I'll say, take a listen to a story about this event in May 2004, told in May 2014, and here we are, about to get into May 2024. We were in my mom's living room, the five of us. My two-year-old niece played with her toys on the floor. My sister, my brother-in-law, and I sprawled on couches and other comfy chairs and considered the question that my mother had just put to us. The question was, are we really going to need that much food? How many people are going to come to this thing, really? My memory is not super clear on which one of us said it, but I'm pretty sure the reaction was, are you kidding? We're going to be swamped. We're going to be up to here in people. We're going to need a lot of copies of the bulletin. We're going to need crowd control. Really? Mom, seriously, only the whole congregation is going to show up for this thing, and that's just for openers. Do you know how many people are going to show up and claim that he did something for them, for them personally, that made their lives all the better? I don't think any of us actually spoke that last sentence. It was implied, though. Nearly ten years later, that scene is plain as day in my mind. Ten years ago today, I wrote in May 2014, my dad passed away. The five of us were sitting around after church, digesting the noon meal, and four of us were trying to wrap our heads around the details of a memorial service. My niece was still happily playing with blocks or something. As I presume is usual in that situation, so many clear understandings were floating just out of our reach, but this one thing, at least, I knew for sure. Mom was crazy. More than a smattering of folks were going to show up. More than a few dozen folks were going to show up. It was slight hyperbole to suggest that half the civilized English-speaking world was apt to show up, but the ushers were going to break a sweat. What I would eventually end up saying in the eulogizing talk that I gave at that memorial service, and what I would go on to write in a couple of online spaces in the time since then, was this. Dad didn't do giant-sized things for people with the intention of putting them on a billboard and pointing and saying, look what I done. He did small things for individuals, a staggering number of them. What goes around comes around is a phrase that applies to good deeds in life, too. I think Dad would be startled to realize just how beloved he really was. He really didn't think too hard about that. So I was comfortably certain that this one time I knew better than my mother. I knew we'd see lots of people at that memorial service and at the visiting hours the night before. Lots and lots. As it turned out, I'd actually lowballed that estimate. Yes, the church was packed full of people, including a full choir that Saturday afternoon. And, as I recall, a whole lot of the church's reliable sources for food preparation swung into action and made sure there was enough food at the reception. But what probably got my attention most that weekend was the line of people at those visiting hours on the Friday evening before. My family and I stood and greeted people for three and a half hours out of a scheduled two. Yes, you heard that right. The line of people extended from the chancel, down the side aisle, to the doors at the back of the sanctuary, out into the narthex, out the exterior doors, and I honestly don't know how much further outside since I was kind of pinned to the chancel. But people stood in line and waited patiently for the opportunity to walk past us and tell, in many, many cases, stories about something kind or helpful that Dennis had done for them, stories we'd never heard before. Current and former congregation members, some of whom had been welcomed to the church by Dad the usher when they had arrived new at the church some Sunday morning recently or long ago. Next-door neighbors. Next-door neighbors years and decades removed from our street. Summer arts camp comrades of mine who remembered Mr. Hammerton, that humorous gentleman with the English accent. My dad's co-workers, some of whom he'd been setting up science experiments with on the day he passed, and some from longer ago than that. A squad of Holy Cross band members with whom I was working at the time they said, your dad came to so many of our home games wearing that tall furry hat and that huge down coat and cheering for the band louder than for the football. 
and a squad of my UMass band alumni friends who had just about those same memories, albeit from 20 years earlier. I've long since given up trying to calculate how many people we greeted in those three and a half hours. It left me shaking my head in wonderment. The guy was so low-key that, in spite of my certainty that he was one of the world's finest examples of human, I was genuinely startled at just how very many other people thought the same thing about my dad for a staggering multitude of reasons. Of course, we miss having him around here with us in person. How many times in the past 10 years, or 20, have I imagined what commentary he would have made about something and chuckled? But if Jackie Robinson was right in saying, a man's life is only worth how much he impacts other people's lives, then, oh yeah, dad's still around. I've said, and I've heard it said by others plenty of times in my life, once a band parent, always a band parent. That's only one of the ways I think of my dad, but it's an important one. Be right back. Okay, let's modulate and get into the trio section. This week in the trio section, I'm having my first conversation with someone whom I've never actually met in person. This is, of course, the glory of the internet. Uh, personally, thanks to an event or two in my life, I've acquired, say, Facebook friends whom I've not ever been in the same physical space with, at least not to my knowledge, but some of those, well, we carry on as if we absolutely had. It's a curious phenomenon. It's a slightly weird version of pen pals from the ancient days of letter writing and such, I suppose. This fine person is a flute, flautist, flutist, conductor, and a tireless motivator of amazing humans. Please help me welcome to the program, Tricia Craig. Hello, Tricia. Hi, Rob. I'm so happy to be here. So excited. Thank you for taking time to do this. We are all busy people, but I have a feeling you're busier than I am. There's no, there's no busy scale. <laughs> we're, all just, we're all just doing. And we, we, you know, in our world, we tend to do lots of different things. So there's just lots of things going on. That's all overlapping projects and all like, kinds exactly. of fun stuff, yeah. Exactly. Technically, we met, I think, in response to a band-related project, and that's a part of your professional life, but there's another part of it that is of interest to me, both generically and also very specifically to this podcast, uh, and I'm willing to bet a chunk of our listenership is going to be interested as well. But first, let me open this up, as I generally do, uh, with a few quick-fire questions so people can get a sense of who they're listening to. Oh, boy. Okay. Great. So first, and I think I gave this one away, but what the heck, I'll ask it anyway. What is your primary instrument? Oh, my primary instrument is flute. Uh, it used to be piccolo, but there's not a lot of call for piccolo at weddings and funerals. And um, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you know, prior to grad school, I switched and, and became a full-on flutist with piccolo as my favorite little sidekick. What's your current band-related role? My current wind band related role is conductor of the Baker Valley Band up in the uh, between the lakes and the uh, mountains in New Hampshire. We're right between the two. It's a great little group. So I'm the conductor of the Baker Valley Band. I do some other gigs, you know, as needed. And uh, yeah, so that's where I'm conducting. Given that this is a band podcast, we feel compelled to ask, what bands have you been active with in your life, whether it's playing or conducting or other sorts of ways? Oh, Wow. Uh, well, of course, high school band, you know, all the way through, you know, I started in third grade and did all the bands and um, I was a big marching band person. So I did competitive marching band in high school at Ithaca College. Of course, I played in the concert and symphonic bands and uh, and then I coached marching band. I wrote drill for years for a, a several uh, competitive groups and uh one that is just was an enthusiastic halftime group. And I let what else I coached the jazz group, the jazz club, it was called at um, Daniel Webster College. I conducted the Farmington Community Band. That was my first foray into community band. It folded with COVID. And that's when Baker Valley Band was like, we need a conductor. I also play regularly in uh, Center Harbor Town Band, and I'm their guest conductor when the conductor needs help. So I've I've conducted there. So yeah, I'm a band geek. I'm all about it. Or my friend, uh, I don't know if you know Sue Densmore, but my my dear friend Sue Densmore, she calls us bandos. I'm a bando. I've bumped into different slang terms for us, and it becomes a question of appropriating or reclaiming the terminology. Well, I mean, in high school, being called a band geek was a nightmare, right? But but now you're like, oh, yeah, I own it. It's cool. And, you know, as a flutist, I play a lot of, there's 
there's not a lot of professional band gigs, which I, I would take every single one. Mm. Uh, so I end up playing a lot of orchestral stuff, which is totally cool. And I play with, I've, I've gotten to play with big, you know, with the Irish tenors and, and mm. uh, Judy Collins. And so it's just some really cool gigs and it's beautiful and awesome. But then, you know, give me Sousa and yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> just give me a Sousa March. Give me some great Randall Standridge. Give me, give me some, give me some band stuff and I'm happy. Orchestral woodwind playing is different from band woodwind playing. Absolutely. And it's, you know, it's a skill and it's beautiful. I, I, I love those gigs. It's fantastic. But then if somebody offers me an opportunity to play or conduct a delicious whole suite or something, then I'm all in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. I run. I run right there. I, I had not known that Farmington was not still a thing. I was going to ask whether you were still with Farmington. So uh, Farmington just um, had... The key key people moved out of the area and and of course covid just shut everything down for a bit and so the there's a couple of people who are holding it together by a, th a thread and what they do is sometimes they just get together and play some things at, at an event so they'll just they'll play some christmas carols or something as a small ensemble for now they've tried a couple of times to revive it as a full-on band and just the logistics uh haven't panned out but Gosh, it's a it's a fantastic community. When I was conducting the band there, every everybody would come out. It's it's sort of a tired little town that that's not doing so well economically. Mm -hmm. And these these people would come out, and it was a real old home day type of feeling. And they they were they were so so grateful and so happy. And so it, it, I loved my time in Farmington, and I'm not opposed to being in Farmington again if if they can make it happen. The people there are just real. They're real. They're real people. They're awesome. So I crossed my fingers for the Farmington band and I don't think anyone has said we no longer exist, but mm, um, okay. they're not, they don't have rehearsals and stuff set up right now. And it almost goes without saying that COVID was an accelerant for demise. Yeah. For difficult situations. Yeah. I'm interested to hear the stories of the bands that do come back from it. Well, that's Baker Valley band. That's where I'm conducting now. And, um, during the tail end of the COVID stuff when we were sort of still not going places, but kind of going places. And they were down as I think, seven members and their band president was sort of holding it together with elastic bands. Like she's just like trying so hard. And um, someone said to me, you know, that they need a conductor. And I was spending pretty much all of my time up in this area. I live up here in the mountain area uh, half a week, and I live at the seacoast the other half of the week. But during COVID, I just sort of planted myself up here. So I met with her and we hit it off. And she said, uh, we agreed that I would, it was my idea to come in and just see if the members were comfortable with me. And so I did, I, I pulled them through one concert. Uh, and then I was like, what do you think? And they're like, let's go full force. So I've been there ever since. And with my background in marketing as well, which we might talk about later, I was able to lead and help them to recruit not only members, but also followers. <laughs> and uh, I mean, one of the early concerts that we did, there were 11 people in the audience. And we just had a concert last uh, weekend with just over 200. People are like, sending messages going when's your next concert we have like what do you call the people who are hardcore followers they go wherever you go that we have some of those and it's pretty cool and with my you know my educational background I'm very respectful of adult learners I admire them yeah. uh, and the members of the band are from all different they have all different musical backgrounds we have one absolute beginner she came and she goes I have a trumpet and I want to learn and she goes, at first, I thought I just wanted to learn to play taps so I could go to uh, military, do the military taps thing. And she said, but now that I hear your band, I want to join the band. And I'm like, just come and you can learn on the move. And she hasn't missed anything. And she sits in, in the concerts, her first couple of concerts, like she played a few notes, you know, like she couldn't do much. And we just paired her up with someone and she's learning, learning. And so now she's like, I'm playing I'm playing a lot of the notes. I'm getting more and more of it. And, and that's the beautiful, like, that's what it's for, right? So um, so I feel like I came in at the right time to lovingly and encouragingly pull people together and pull people in and also be able to do some of the, the visual, the marketing side of it. Mm. So that we've, we've got quite a following up here in the Baker Valley area. Our concert that we do at this time of year is our mud season concert. Because if you've ever <laughs> been to... Uh, this area in New Hampshire, it is mud, all mud all the time. 
uh, and and one of the things that I did for community building and and marketing and, and encouraging was when we were talking about the spring concert, some of the longtime members were talking about being very formal, you know, wearing formal orchestral looking concert clothes, you know. And I said, you know, we're in New Hampshire and uh, we're in mud season. And um, what if we wore boots and jeans and our polo shirts. And they were like, oh, I'm not sure. So I put, presented it to the band. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a collaborative leader, you know? So I presented it to the band and I said, you know, here's why. We can just make everybody feel comfortable coming. A lot of times, and this is the marketer speaking, people don't go to concerts because they don't know what to expect. They, they don't know how to behave. They don't know what it's going to be like. You know, um, they, they might have gone to a concert once where they clapped between movements and everybody yeah. hissed at them yeah. and now yeah. they're afraid to go, right? Yeah. So I just try to make everyone know that it's fun and it's family friendly. Anyone can, can, can have fun there, can, can enjoy it. And so the first year that I... Um, that we did the did it as mud season, the band agreed. So our mud season concert where we wear boots and we we joke, kick off the mud first, because you don't want to track it into the building. <laughs> but we wear boots and we wear jeans and we wear our white polo shirts and maybe our uh, we have a red fleece. Some people throw that on, but uh, it's it's very casual and we tell the audience the same way, wear your boots. So and, and in doing that, we're making them know you don't have to wear it. You don't have to dress up. You don't have to you just come enjoy it. And and I think that made a big difference. And, um, you know, people come just happy to be there instead of worried about how to how to be there. And uh, the band loves it. Everybody loves it. And and I think that in marketing speak, it's called atmospherics, right? How you the atmosphere that you create in the space that you're in. And for us, you know, one of the founders of the Baker Valley Band is very clear that the most important rule for our band is to have fun. You know, there's def different definitions. I think it's fun to play really, really well. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I encourage them to practice and learn and to expand. And I help them with, um, you know, intonation and things like that. Because then when we play really, really well, like, it's just so exhilarating. There's no feeling like ending a concert and being like, so that we did it together, right? I was just driving the bus. They did all the playing and 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 listening and and reacting to each other and 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 the audience, you know, cheering. Like they kept at the mud season concert last weekend. It was a standing ovation. It just kept going and going and going and going. And when they finally stopped clapping, a couple of people afterwards came up to me and said, "Well, we thought you'd do an encore." <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> what do you want, the world? <laughs> You've just done a nice amount of mentioning of the marketing angle on getting a band moving forward. You set the golf ball squarely on the tee. I'm going to hit it. I'd love it if you'd talk a bit about the marketing and business assistance project that you've got going. It's um, actually the culmination of everything I've done in my whole life. It all just came together, honestly, during COVID. And um, just a precursor to COVID, I live where I live. There's blizzards and for some reason it doesn't matter which day of the week is my heaviest teaching week that year that day will be when all the blizzards hit so I lose yeah. a big chunk of money mm. uh, so as soon as I was aware of zoom which now we can't imagine not being aware of it but I made a policy that on heavy snow days we still have our lessons but they're on zoom and so that first year that I did that suddenly I wasn't losing any income due mm. to the storms right and when COVID hit, and also I'm a heavy duty art collector. I I own more art than I have walls. I have uh, everything's a handmade jewelry, handmade mugs. You know, I'm I'm really into the arts community. So when COVID hit, I, I, nothing happened different for me. I was just like, okay, we'll we'll just do we'll just do the Zoom lessons. We'll do snowstorm lessons for a couple of weeks, and then it'll be over. We'll go back. You know, we all know that that didn't work out quite like that. But so I just kept going. And um, I already had people sending, you know, I was already doing PayPal. I was already doing some of those automated things just to make it easier for my, my students, my flute students. So um, when COVID hit and everybody was saying, oh, now I can't teach. Now I can't play. Now I can't sell my art. I can't. And I was like, no, no, no. I, let me help you. Let me help you. Let me help you. And so uh, this one colleague that I just adore, I, I don't know if you know Lou Stamus. He's a, a Reeds player. He's fantastic. He's a sweet guy. And he was just lamenting. And so I reached out to him and I said, Lou, let me just show you how you can use 
you can still teach. I'll show you. So I showed Lou how to use Zoom and PayPal. And then I was like, I've got something here. So I started a group to help people. And that's all it was. I'm like, we're all stuck at home. Just join my group. I think it had a different name back then. But and little by little, it grew outside of people I knew. It just kept growing. Somebody reached out to me and said, do you do coaching? And I already had a coaching business when I, um, I owned a music school for 22 years. When I closed the music school, I continued coaching students on how to get accepted into college through their musical training. Um, so I had this business doing that and that crashed and burned during COVID because nobody knew. Right? But I had a coaching system set up. Mm -hmm. I had packages. I had a system. So several months into my support group thing where I was just helping people get through the businessy stuff of, of your creative life, uh, somebody reached out to me and said, do you do coaching? I think I need your help. And I was like, yes, as a matter <laughs> of fact, I do. And then I just changed all the wording and all of the coaching I did and, and, and turned it into a, a, a coaching for businessy people. And as I started working with her, I was like, wow, this is First of all, I didn't know that I knew stuff that nobody else knew. I kind of thought that everybody else had had struggled to figure out all these things too. And as a business owner, when I owned the music school and when I've always um, managed my own career, I worked with business coaches because I just felt like everybody else must know something I don't know because this is not easy. And so I learned and I got good at it. And then COVID just showed me, Tricia, nobody knows this stuff. And I was really strongly called to start helping because I, I, I can make it a big difference. And, and my revelation is that the starving artist is a myth that we were taught. Mm. Um, and, you know, I talk to people and they say, well, like I was talking to this young man and he said, I'd, I'd love to become a jazz drummer, but I've talked to my, my drum teacher and he said that it's impossible that you can't make any money doing it. And I said, does he make money doing it? And he said, no. And I said, do you know of any drummers who make money doing it? He's like, what do you mean? And I said, list me the famous jazz drummers that you know. And so he starts listing them. And I said, have you been to their concerts? He's like, oh, yeah, this woman, she was amazing. And this guy. And I was like, OK, so you need to talk to them. You're talking to the people who haven't figured it out. Those aren't the people to talk to. If you're trying to, if you're trying to become a millionaire, don't talk to people who are, are struggling to feed their family. You want to talk to somebody who's learned how to become a millionaire. You know, if you want to lose weight, you don't talk to somebody who, who is struggling to lose weight. You talk to someone who's done it and knows how to do it, right? You talk to the people who have been there. Uh, and it's the same with artists. I, I met with an amazing artist uh, a couple of weeks ago and she's amazing. She's won national awards and she's struggling to sell her work. And it turns out that she is trying to sell her work in this little local craft place. And I'm like, you, you know, you've outgrown the craft place. And she's like, Oh, I've always been there. That's where I've always done it. And I was like, and it's time to move forward. It's time to move on. And she strongly disagreed and she, she's going to stay at the craft place struggling to sell stuff that you know people are going there just to, to buy crafts and uh her work belongs in higher end places but she doesn't believe enough in, in herself I could see the blocks she's just she was like couldn't believe that she might actually belong there and so I feel like I feel like I'm here to guide the the creative ones to move forward maybe in that case it's a case of yeah you go to the next place and you credit where you came from and you make sure people know about them so that you can yes uh, yes that's a beautiful way to put it actually you know and and maybe that would be that's actually i'm going to steal that because i think <laughs> that that could be a great way for people to understand that they can still honor that place and move forward at the same time yeah let's let's just say that i've stolen enough from your <laughs> business <laughs> stuff thing that i think it's going to it's it, I, this will begin to start to even it out, maybe. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that insight. Yeah. So the group you just mentioned it. The group I I I changed the name. I was the name is now Businessy Stuff for Creative Ones. That's the name of the group on Facebook, and that's the free group. Anyone can join it. There's some um, entrance questions, but but that's where it's mostly artists and musicians and. Um, creative thinkers who don't fit into business boxes, you know, so a lot of people with spirit based practices or, um, or therapists or things like that are in the group too. And cheerfully, it has occurred to me as you were telling that story that we started out thinking of COVID as an accelerant for difficult situations. And for you, COVID seems to have been an accelerant for a forward moving one. 
it was revelatory for me. I was talking to somebody else yesterday um, and she was like, I, I'm afraid to tell people, but COVID was the best thing that ever happened to me and my family, you know? And, you know, for me as well, um, I learned some things about myself that I have just embraced. One of which is I'm an extreme extrovert. I knew that, but I am not often comfortable in random like groups of people, right? So networking, like going to a networking event, I hate it because, mm. uh, and I was talking with a dear friend about this the other day, and she's an introvert who likes to be around people. It turns out I'm an extrovert who prefers to, to be around people uh, with intention, right? And to have an actual intelligent conversation, all that fluffy stuff just really grates on me. And so uh, that's okay. During COVID, it was all very intentional and I was on fire all the time. It was really great. And it's also when I realized that I've been preparing for this um, business coaching thing. A phrase that will be familiar to a good number of my listeners uh, is one that was thrown at me by a college band director, which is, if you act the part long enough, you become it. And I started out life as a shy person. And people who knew me when I was in the second and third and fourth grade would look at me. I went to become a public school teacher. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a church musician. I'm doing a podcast where I'm talking to people. The people who knew me back then would look at me and say, who are, who are you and what have you done with Rob? <laughs> That's so great, yeah. <laughs> and, th and think about COVID. I always feel like I want to be careful about it because it goes without saying, but it's also worth saying it. COVID cost many people many things, including lives. The thing that I think we all do take care with is to yeah, pointing to the old making the best of a bad situation or always look on the bright side of life and whatnot and we, without being Pollyanna-ish about it because people did lose lives and family members and all the rest of it to take a situation which is not optimal and find something that you can bring out of it that at least do I want to say honors the struggle I don't know but that it's another perspective I think there's, yeah. there's you know um, because yeah it was a tragic and horrible and difficult time and so to be able to see that it was possible for some of us, for many people to find things, you know, a lot of people got outside for the first time and they were hiking and they were, there were some things that we did out of the desperate time that showed that we are still human and that, and that there can be, there can be beauty in difficult times. You know, four years ago to the moment, a month in, two months in, a half a year in, we still weren't sure that there was a way out. Right. And Obviously, you, you can only view the past when once you get to the future and look back and say, OK, so for for the people who were fortunate enough to stay out of harm's way and do the vaccine thing and all the rest of the stuff that we, that we had to do in order to make that happen, you don't have any idea of the path until you turn around and look and say, OK, they're the tracks. Hmm. Yes. And that's how it is with my business coaching career. I turn around and I'm like, oh, look, everything led right to this moment. And working with my clients, they're just the coolest people, jewelers and, and musicians and youth orchestras. And I mean, and watching them start to be confident and see that they can make a difference. They can sell their work. And it's interesting. I mean, I know this is a band pod podcast, but so one of my taglines for the name of my business is uh, Creatives as Entrepreneurs. And when I first started, I was like, I can help you with all the businessy stuff. Well, what it's really turned into is a little bit of mindset and a lot of marketing. And those are the two things where people were lacking the most. And that's where I tend to help the most. I think a lot of creative ones, a lot of musicians, a lot of artists feel like perhaps we don't come to the table with something as valuable as some of the important people, you know, during COVID, the scientists were really important, right? The scientists and the people who could, the doctors and the first responders, those people were so important. The essential workers, the people who were, who were identified as essential. <laughs> right, right. And so why should I, why should I do a violin recital on, on Facebook? Why should I, why should my band play? Uh, why should I be selling art? when people are struggling, I, what is that? That's that's not okay. But the thing is, I, one of my clients is a jeweler and we were talking about her audience and she makes really colorful, funky jewelry for funky ladies. And they're all, all of her people are over 40. And one of her people, she asked about the jewelry and she said that something like, I don't care what anyone thinks of this bracelet. It's a bright purple glass beads, colorful bracelet. She said, I put it on and I feel happy. And I'm like, 
that somebody looks at that painting, they feel happy. Somebody wears that jewelry, they feel happy. I mean, it, feeling happy is a really important thing and bringing that to the table. So the, so the essential workers are saving lives. That's like, we can't all be those people. And then for somebody to walk around feeling happy because they heard you play your music, like that's just yeah. as valuable in a different yeah. way, right? You know, I, my tagline is the world needs your light now more than ever. And if you look around, it, there's a lot of darkness out there. And, you know, this the, the people who came to the Mud Season concert for the Baker Valley Band, they're sending messages saying, when's your next concert? They're all excited to come again because they were happy. They had fun. And when horrible things are going on all over the world, to have an afternoon where you leave exuberant, I, I just think that's a, a, a an important an important gift for you to be in, in in front of a business or an activity that is it's making people happy it's it's encouraging them it's encouraging them to to emphasize the positive and to develop what what, what they're doing whether you're in front of the businessy stuff group or in front of the Baker Valley band right you know, or whether, whether we're in front of a community band somewhere the members of which are there for two reasons they love to play music and they want to have a good time. And they want their community, you know, yeah. um, my accompanist is a church organist and she, or she changed her career to a different church because the church she was at wanted to move away from hymnody. And she was saying that she felt very strongly that there should be music in your world that takes you from cradle to grave. Right. And these, these hymns do that. Mm -hmm. And I feel the same way about community band where you know, a lot of these people, they, they played in elementary school and they are high school or college. Uh, and then a lot of them continued. But for many of them, they came back to it. They come back to the music. Right. And here they are, you know, they raised a family and they did all the things and they're looking at retirement and they come back to their people and they're like, ah, oh, these are my people. You know, there's a woman in the band who, who joined the band about a year ago and, and, and she, very tearfully was like, I finally found my people again, you know? Yes, of course, the music and there's nothing like being in a wind band. I just, I just love, I love it. But it's far bigger than that. You know, we, we learn skills and I don't just mean chromatic scales. Like we learn actual skills, life skills by being on these musical teams. You know, no one sits on the bench, you know? So, so the dude that plays really flat all the time, like we, that's part of the team and we need to work together to bring that up and to, and, and, and so everybody feels a connection and a commitment. And then, you know, when you're, uh, I mean, when I was in Farmington, one of the guys came up to me and he said, you know, I was new. And so people were telling me about the band. He goes, this band saved my life. Mm -hmm. uh, his, his wife had died and it was a very difficult time and he was a widower. And he said, if it weren't for this band, I would still just be sitting alone in my home and I mean come on come on come on that's uh uh and and you know just in the in in the Baker Valley band since I've been there for I don't know four four years three three years you know there people have had deaths in their family or illness or you know challenging situations or and we're all there for each other it's like a it's it's like a musical family and it's far more important I don't know, maybe even to the members than it is to the community in some ways, but, um, and then to go out and to be able to serve the community by bringing people in and, and connecting with other businesses and things. It's, it's so powerful. It's the best, most G-rated double entendre in the world. <laughs> so in true ABA form, we have started out in band and we have gone to, uh, <laughs> to the business, uh, the, the businessy stuff end of it. And we've worked our way back toward band. So I'm going to go with that little trend and okay. move to the the questions that I traditionally uh, seem to ask at the end of this. Uh, amongst those are, what's one of your favorite pieces of band music that you've played? Well, I always love uh, Sousa. I have a serious Sousa thing. Um, <laughs> I love the Washington Post. I just love the Washington mm. Post. You'd think, I'm a piccolo player. You'd think the Stars and Stripes. Yeah, yeah. But the Washington Post is just so, is so charming. But also my band... Last year, we played Choose Joy by Randall Standridge. And gosh, I mean, it, it was, it, that's, that's, that's in my heart a lot. I love that piece. Is there a piece of band music that you haven't played, but that you'd like to? One that I haven't conducted. I've played mm. it 
um, but I haven't conducted is um, John Mackey's Foundry. Oh, I love that piece. Oh my gosh. So that's one that I haven't, um, I haven't conducted. I have played it. That's an answer to that question I hadn't thought of, but I can think of all the, I, in the last year and a half that I've been with the band I've been with, I've conducted pieces that I had played before and conducted in the car a lot. <laughs> yes. but actually got to conduct with humans and such and and yeah, yeah i got the goosebumps yeah i did right it's cool <laughs> is there a band that you'd love to perform with that you haven't because either you aren't the right age or you're not in the right place at the right time oh the marines the president's own <laughs> right wow that's their that's the they're the ultimate in my mind and of course my dad served in the marines and of course Sutha. and so you put that all together and um one of my friends from high school just retired from the president. So from, oh, uh, nice. yeah. yeah. Mm. Here's one of the last couple of questions. Tell me one of your favorite band stories. There's, well, I just did. I love that story of the widower who said that band, you know, saved his life. And a lot of my favorite band stories are just those revelatory moments that happen in a rehearsal where all of a sudden we, we get it. You know, um, we had a moment just last night, um, with the Baker Valley Band where a couple of years ago, I got them an easy piece to play with Smoke on the Water and it was a flex band version, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and it was super easy. And when we played it, it was a struggle uh, and they had to work really hard and they've come so far. And last night I was like, we were just reading through stuff in our folders. And I said, let's, let's give that one a shot. We have outgrown that piece so far. And it sounded like it, when I finished, I said, we outgrew that piece. We're so far beyond this piece. Uh, the rhythms, everything that they had struggled with a couple of years ago. And that was a really, those little moments like that, that that's, those are my favorite. It's really great. Every so often with my church choir, we'll bring an anthem back uh, and, and I will be able to look at them and say, do you remember a few years ago when that was hard? <laughs> right, right, yeah. 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 That's where Baker Valley band is right now. They're, they're playing at a great level and they're, they, they, they got bigger and they're, they're amazing people and a uh, great community. And they're, they're in a great, really great spot right now, musically and artistically and uh, interpersonally. It's fantastic to watch. I love being part of it. Now, my standard last question is, have you got a favorite band life lesson or a bit of wisdom that you found useful outside of it? It sounds as if we've covered that, doesn't it? <laughs> we've covered a lot of it, yeah. yeah. The, the one thing that we learn through music and band is how to practice. Kids aren't learning that today, and it's needed in every single field. Every single field people need to learn. They need to know how to learn and how to strive for excellence and um how to fail and get back up. Yeah. And those lessons through music, I think are the ones I carry with me every single day. You know, you have a bad audition and you learn how to fix it and you try again the next time, you know, or, or you have a bad performance or a bad practice session, anything, you know, and you learn how to pick up the pieces and keep going. And we learn that through music. Seems to me in a couple of places, you are busy propping people up and, and setting them up not to fail. That's cool. That's what I love to do cheer people on. I'm so glad we got to make this conversation happen. We've been batting this back and forth for a while now. Right, right. <laughs> I know the ideas you put up on your businessy stuff page have made me think differently about the process of getting what is admittedly a passion project into something maybe poised to be a bit more business-like. And I, I hope that my listenership has too, at the very least. And maybe we've convinced some of those to check out your business-like project and get some assistance for themselves. Yeah. Is there some place online that you would be happy to have people find you? Yeah, they can look up the group, Business C Stuff. It's got a hyphen, business hyphen Y, Business C Stuff for creative ones. It's a great place to learn marketing for the other conductors and band leaders that you're talking to on this podcast. I've done all the work for the Baker Valley Band too, so I've been teaching them how to do it. So uh, I have some great examples that are specific to band as well. Well, Tricia Craig, thank you so much for giving us a bit of your valuable time. Thank you. This is fun. Look forward to chatting again in some form, in some forum. Let's do it. Thank you so much. Okay, one last break, and then we'll head for the final bar line. Thanks so much for staying with me. Here comes the dogfight. fight. 
This week's dogfight is a joke. No, really, I just read a joke online and I thought I'd share. Here it comes. A band director was walking on the beach when he came upon an old lamp. You know the story. He rubbed the lamp. A genie appeared and granted him a wish. The band director thought long and hard and finally said, I'd really like to have peace in the Middle East. The genie said, I've been in that lamp for a thousand years. What's going on in the Middle East? The band director produced his smartphone with its news updates and a map of the Middle East, showing the various factions at odds with each other, the socioeconomic issues, and the constantly shifting boundaries over the centuries. The genie studied the map and finally said, I don't think I can grant this wish. It's just too complicated. Isn't there another wish you'd like? The band director thought about it and said, Well, I've always wanted a soprano saxophone that could play in tune. The genie said, Let me see that map again. I'm here all week. And I'm a saxophone player, so I can do that joke. Okay, one last pause. Let's recover from that, and then I'll finish with a brief thought. Thanks for hanging around. To wrap up this week, let's take the coda. The coda this week has a bit more in it than usual. Hey, the dogfight was short, so I've got a moment, and I want to take that moment to do another tiny pulling back of the curtain on how this podcast is put together. This time, I'm specifically focusing on the language that I use as part of my narrations, intros and outros, that sort of thing. In short, singular, not plural. Now, what the heck does that mean? Well, it kind of goes back to something I heard years ago while I was listening to the audiobook version of a book about ESPN's Sports Center show as it existed in the 1990s, which was written and narrated by Dan Patrick and Keith Olbermann, the rather iconic co-hosts at the time. The audiobook described all kinds of behind-the-scenes machinations and hijinks and all the catchphrases, he put the biscuit in the basket, and a bit of the businessy stuff involved in Sports Center and the TV business in general but it also had quite a few pretty wise insights into the crafting of the language that was used on air, whether it was scripted or off the cuff, as most of the highlight narrations were. And Olbermann recounted some advice he had gotten at some point early in his career as a radio voice. First, he said, When you're coming out of a commercial break, never say, Welcome back. Your audience didn't go away during that break. You did. He also said this, and this is the bit of advice that unwittingly Olbermann passed along to me for my personal usage, although he didn't know it, and while I was listening to the audiobook, I didn't know it either. Never say, hi everybody. That implies that you are talking to multiple people at once. If you're lucky, many people are listening to you simultaneously, but do you know how many people are listening to you or watching you on TV in any given room at any given time? One. Maybe a couple, but likely just one if it's a newscast. People rarely hold viewing parties for the 11 o'clock news on TV Channel 5. But each individual listener is one single human, and you are talking to that person. So, address that person in the singular, somehow, but not with, Hi, everybody! So, I've worked really hard to make sure that, as much as possible, I follow that advice. Haven't been perfect, but I've tried. Because, similarly, there's only one person wearing a pair of earbuds at a time to listen to a podcast. I know there are splitter devices designed to make it possible to plug two sets of headphones into one headphone jack, but I have never, ever seen two people taking a walk tethered to each other by a splitter cord. That was the intention, I know, but I've just never seen it. I also don't know how often multiple people sit in a room and listen to this podcast. For the sake of my download numbers being as high as possible, I hope that every single person downloads and listens individually, but that's not really my point here at all. Back in the very first episode of Bandwagon, and here we are at episode 10 now, At the very beginning of the first, first strain, I said this. Hello, dear listener of this podcast, and trust me, this early in this program's life, you, you individually, are very important. And ever since then, for the very most part, I have resisted the reflexive American broadcasting habit of saying, welcome back, everyone, after those pregnant pauses between segments. Hopefully one day those pauses get filled with ad reads, but again, that's not my point here. My point is this. Thank you, dear listener. Not dear listeners, although I hope lots of people are listening, but as my drum major academy friend and colleague, the great Jamie Weaver, once said to a group of students, the important thing is that you are a person. Every one of you is a person and therefore worthy of respect. I guess that's what I'm trying to achieve, recognizing something that is true, which is, again, yes, one of the goals of Bandwagon is to build a little listening community, but every community is made up of individual persons, and every one of them is important. And I thank you, yes, you specifically, for helping launch this podcast project. Okay, now go spread the word, share the podcast, and then we can talk about the plural form and multiple people and big piles of listeners and lots of downloads. And I'll tell you how to do that now.
That's Bandwagon for this week. Thanks, as always, for downloading and listening. Bandwagon was written, researched, and produced by your humble host. Musical interludes were produced by Hammerton Media from source material largely by John Philip Sousa. You can listen to more episodes at our website, heyband.podbean.com. Please give me feedback. Be polite, but let me know what you like and what you think might change. Tell me your best band story. Suggest a topic for a future episode. Whatever you like. You can do that using our email address, heybandwagon at yahoo.com, or leave us a 90-second voice message by going to speakpipe.com slash heybandwagon. Be aware that we do reserve the right to include your message on the podcast, unless you say otherwise. All those contact links and links to our news items, conversation topics, and my interview guest, Trisha Craig, can be found in our show notes. Please share the show on social media, and thank you for that. If you enjoyed this podcast, get someone else to listen as well. Word of mouth is the best recruiting tool. And to keep up with us every week, subscribe to Bandwagon on the Podbean app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please give us a five-star review. It really helps other people to find the show. For now, take care, stay in touch, stay in tune, and we'll do this all again next week. I'm Rob Hammerton. Detail, fallout. <laughs>